good to see everybody here. It's good to be with the Red Food people again. Mahalo ke akua. May it be in heaven as it is on earth, as above, so below. Please give us this day and forgive us. And please help us to forgive. Mahalo ke akua. No temptation, no evil. Mahalo Kyakua. May we be a blessing to each other. Mahalo Kyakua. May you be a blessing to us all. A blessing on our families, on our food, on the places we live, on the water that serves us all. Mahalo Kyakua. Mahalo Nui Kalani uh, for taking the time and your, I know you have so many things going on and uh, it's it's really it's unbel- a beautiful, beautiful day. This was my birthday week, as you know, and I want you to know today for the first time in five years, I walked out into the food forest and worked in the garden for three hours without a walking stick, without a cane, without anything. So the garden, the farm still heal us. The plants will heal us. Thank you, everybody. Keep up the good work. Thank you. That's a, that's a miracle. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone, to this third webinar in the Breadfruit People series. Um, I'm very excited to be here. We have an incredible lineup of presenters, and we have lots of um, lots of presentations. And we will end with discussion and question and answers. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here and sharing this time with us, um, and to um, explore how we can support the breadfruit world together and synergize in our, in our activities, in our minds and hearts around breadfruit and everything that is connected to breadfruit. Mahalo Nui, thank you, Vinaka Vakalevo. And um, so uh, I think we can just begin. Auntie Shirley Kauhai Hao, who has been with us for the past two webinars, sends her aloha to everyone. She was unable to make it today, but she, certainly will watch the recorded version, which we will post later. Uh, I invite everyone to uh, enter your questions into the Q&A box. There's a, it says Q&A at the bottom of your screen, question and answers, as those questions come up. And so we will go through the presentations, um, one after the other, and then we will handle all the questions at the end of the session. So please put your questions into the Q&A box. And of course, you're welcome to put your comments and thoughts and introductions into the chat box. So there's two separate places to uh, put your uh, questions and um, your comments. So um, if you just give me a moment here, I will change that. So our first presenter today um, almost needs no introduction. It's Doc Tusi. Um, he's director of the Pacific Business Center at the Scheidler Business College at uh, the University of Hawaii and well known throughout the Pacific for his deep connection to the people, to the land, to the culture and traditions of the Pacific. And he will open our webinar today uh, and speak about um, the culture of food security. So thank you very much, Dr. Tusi, for being here. And uh, we so enjoy having you. And, and could you please unmute? Uh, 
Um, please unmute, Doc. Here, how's that? Yes, good. Okay, sorry. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to participate and support uh, um, all efforts towards the uh, Breadfruit Initiative. I'm, I'm with the University of Hawaii Pacific Business Center. We're basically a U.S. Department of Commerce program that's, that uh, focuses on economic development. And much of our work is focused on working collabor collaboratively and organizing subject matter experts. We are not the experts, we facilitate. So we work with people in uh, as many as 10 different universities. We try to tap into the best people in that particular field. We bring them together, we generate information and then we share it. That's all we do. And uh, I think this is what, this is our support role. Uh, it's the best kind of support role because it, um, in most cases costs very little. Most of the work is supported by other funding. We do business plans, feasibility studies, research markets, product analysis, et cetera. So we know what we can do and how we can best help. So we, we don't lead, we help facilitate and support. Uh, one of the things, um, uh, I, usually people that have not heard of our center are, you know, question, well, What's your te technical abilities? Well, if you're working collaboratively with experts, uh, your technical abilities are extraordinary. Let me give you an example. Uh, the Pacific Business Center has 10 national awards and a whole bunch of other regional awards. It's not from our center per se, but it's for our collaborative relationships with the experts. So when we put it out there, it's really good. Um, past three years in a row, we've had national awards. Um, Craig's the national award winner with the Bradford Initiative, among other things. So, so that being said, uh, I think you can pull us up on our, our website. And uh, we're always standing by and anxious to work collaboratively with the region. Uh, one of the areas I think that's very important that we feel we needed to move towards is looking at the more cultural traditional perspectives. Before, uh, they were not even considered seriously. But now uh, I realize that uh, after all these years, it's essential, it's central. Because if you don't have the mindset that's connected to the spiritual aspects and components of the island and trees, you may actually miss the boat and create more harm than good. And we know that all the wisdom uh, keepers of all the islands say the same thing. We are all connected. We are family. And how do they describe the islands? It's our mother. So if you have that kind of a mindset, you're careful how you plant those trees, how you care for those trees. If you, if you care for it as your mother, as our ancestors did, that tree will thrive and the harvest will be abundant. But if once you shift away uh, and, and look exclusively at that uh, just taking, and you're looking only at making money, you're actually endangering the island, you're hurting the mother. So uh, these are the kinds of things that we take to look at because I think the real importance is how do you weave traditional wisdom and, and spiritual beliefs with modern science, technology, and knowledge. The key is the weaving, it's not either or. And I think, <clears throat> and I think that's that's been one of the most gratifying uh, aspects of of uh, what I do with with uh, at the Pacific Business Center. Uh, another component I think is really important to realize: we need to engage the local farmers more as as more now than ever before, and especially those who have been doing it for millenniums. They know more than the money, you know, it's interesting, I bring in the science, he says, well, what do you say? Well, why don't we ask the farmer? Okay, so uh, another uh, small component is uh, the intuitivity, the intuitive thinking, because most island people think intuitively, they feel intuitively. And of course, my, my, my more uh, um, uh, scientifically oriented colleagues would say, well, you know, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Well, first of all, we need to look at our language. 
Our language is, the, is we use metaphor, allegory, illusion. Those are the languages that enable us to touch and feel and sense the sacredness of, the, of our environment, of the trees, of the fish. All of our great uh, fishermen, all of our great warriors and navigators, they all speak of attunement and every island I've been to. And to, to, uh, to not tap into this, I think would be, uh, uh, I, I think it would be a, a mistake and I would encourage people to do so. And they say, well, uh, you know, that, that's the old way, old fashioned, uh, uh, it's unchristian and all that sort of thing. And they said, wait a minute, you know, there is a wonderful, there is a, a, a wonderful uh, quote that's attributed to Albert Einstein. And he said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind, a faithful servant. We have created a society where we honor the servant and forgotten the gift. So... If one of the most brilliant minds who ever walked the earth acknowledged the importance of intuition, then certainly what our ancestors sense and feel must have some validity because if it's acknowledged at that level, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And then uh, for those of you who are into music, uh, a wonderful, wonderful saying is, is by Mozart. Uh, Mozart published 600... Uh, compositions. The guy died at 35. He was brilliant. But so somebody asked him, so where, 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 the, where, the, where, the, where does the music come from? And uh, you know what he said? The music does not come from the notes, but the silence in between. If that's not intuitive sensing, what is? And so anyway, I, I just use that uh, very quickly to point out that as we move forward, let's move forward with the canoe and the outrigger. The outrigger is our wisdom. And the, the canoe, that's the knowledge. Be cautious, don't let knowledge outrun wisdom. They must go together. And that's why I'm so pleased to see that we engage elders. The last thing I would like to see is a bunch of young PhDs, very knowledgeable, but we need, we need the outrigger. Right now, some of some of our younger, uh, uh, especially some of my Samoan uh, uh, young um, uh, PCs, they don't want an outrigger or a sail. You know, what they want they want an outboard motor. So okay, but but this is these are the kinds of things we can adapt to, and most of us uh, nearing retirement age, we have been able to balance and weave uh, traditional wisdom and spirituality with modern science, knowledge, and technology. Please continue to do so. Let's come up with a better way in which we can care for the earth and assure its health and at the same time be prosperous economically and in other ways so we can share our prosperity with the rest of the world. So mahalo Craig, uh, appreciate the opportunity and mahalo for all of you to continue to do what you're doing with of course the very foundation of what all Pacific people believe our foundation is aloha. So, aloha. Mahalo, Nuri Doc. Um, it's so inspiring to hear you. And thank you again for taking your time to, to share with us in that way. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful for the many years we've worked together. And I've learned so much from you. Um, let's move to our uh, next speaker, and we're so honored to have Eminer Johnson here. Um, Eminer is Executive uh, Director of the Island Food Community of Pohnpei, and she is passionate about traditional local food, the skills around growing local food and caring for the environment. And she's a strong advocate for women empowerment in communities and faith-based activities. So, um, Eminer, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome. And um, if you could please just unmute yourself, and I will I will run your um, PowerPoint presentation. So please uh, take it away.
I'll say Lelia Nainko. My name is Amina. I am working at Island Food Community of Bone Bay, which is a non-profit organization. Our aim is to project increase in production and consumption of our local foods for our known campaign of let's go local for chief. Our resources are available at you can check us out at islandfood.org and we also have a Facebook page. It's Island Food Community of Bombay and other videos as shown in this uh, presentation on this slide. Thanks. Because of the raising chronic diseases that have made our islands Pacific Island, there is maybe the rest of the world with chronic disease. And at the same time, in Pond Bay, we were never before the establishment of this NGO known as nutritional analysis or nutritional content of our local foods until Dr. Lois Engelberger has analyzed our local foods and because of the re result of her <clears throat> studies, she has revealed that these foods are so healthy. And yet we're <clears throat> at a time that because of the influence of Western culture, our, our influences from outside in FSMR in Bonbe has made the people kind of shift away from these traditional foods. So she established with others, I think it's gonna be in the next, it's gonna be the next uh, presenter, Mr. Adelino Lawrence, to start this NGO to raise awareness on the so many healthy benefits of eating local foods. We call this, she called this, let's go local for chief. So some of the foods that she has analyzed is um, in the next page. Yeah, is that these foods are so rich in vitamin A that it can help protect or fight against the non-communicable diseases that has been uh, killing most of the people in Pune Bay. <clears throat> so with this NGO going, it's that's why we want to raise more awareness in utilizing our local foods because of its scientific um, research and findings. Also, it also proved to ourselves that though these foods were are, were the only foods before the influence our Western uh, influence game, which is in 1945. Based on studies, there was no NCD, no art diseases in Bone Bay, based on the US Naval Study Report. And there were no diabetes. And what, so when we look back, when she looked back, wow, people at that time, our ancestors, our grandparents, forefathers and mothers, they only eat the local food or what these blessings that our almighty father has placed on these islands. And it was not a mistake that we are the inhabitants of these islands. So that, that is one of the goals or missions of uh, island food community of people. Next, next. So, so visiting or going back to our island, our communities, raising awareness after so many years, still our surveys find that people still rely or eat, consume more unhealthy processed foods than eating healthy local foods after so many awarenesses. And when I ask 
why they know and they're not eating local food. The, the challenge or the answer from the community level people is because it takes a long time, you know, modern um, growing up in this modern world, our, our children, we want to train them uh, to be competitive in the global world. So they are being introduced to new technology. And so taking time to cook or prepare local food is one of the challenges. So Island Food want to take it to the next step of how do we make our foods easily access to mothers? So we turn them into flour. So consumption of local food is not being delayed or not being a problem anymore. If we can lessen the problem of, or to increase the consumption of our local foods through easier uh, recipes from flour based, so we started to um, go to the next step of improvising our local foods into flour stage. So some of the research of the flour that we process here in Pond Bay are um, <clears throat> including breadfruit is as shown on this graph is um, the graph is the green represent these are names in uh, Panabin, and the green bars are breadfruit. So the first green bar is breadfruit. Second green bar is breadfruit with skin and core, which there is nothing being wasted. So, and this is about F as, you know, you can read it in the PowerPoint. It's about half a cup, which is 100 gram per this uh, breadfruit flour, and this is how much you can get in micrograms of protein. Next. And whereas we compare to the white flour, you know, you can see it on the chart, the white flour also, we, uh, we include that so it can be comparable to uh, the local food flour that is being uh, turned into flour. So again, in calcium, same, that's the green uh, represent breadfruit compared to the last bar on my on our right, which is the white flower. Next, we also also same as dietary fiber, same amount per hundred gram, and it's um, for your information. The other uh, bars that are yellow is the first three is banana. The one with WS is uh, with skin. And Karach is a state banana, which is very high in vitamin A and also with skin. And so breadfruit and transform taro is next to breadfruit and compared to white imported flour. Next. <clears throat> So also we look for, you know, other nutrients like magnesium and and as you can see, this is so we wanted to the reason why uh, we want this to be analyzed on in Bone Bay we don't have labs or institute that that can do nutrition or nutrient analysis. That's why um, we're relying and all the books that the students are learning about foods. They're about foods that are nutrient, about uh, nutrient foods that are not from our island. So with this one, we want to validate so why they should eat local food with, it's not just because it's, um, it's locally available and it's sustainable in our traditional agroforest system, farming system, but also to give them the nutrient analysis. So it, you know, more, more, uh, more good reasons or benefits that why sh we should utilize and eat our local foods. 
Next. Yeah, same in potassium. So as in general, the, it will still be the same in iron. As in general, as you can see, those that WS is with skin, that it is um, in general, all the graphs, the flower that we include the skin, it is always higher than those that it's just the meat or the flesh. So in general, that's and all the graphs also, it shows that all the nutrient uh, values of our local food flour is much higher in content or nutrient value compared to the white flour, imported white flour. So in general, this is just another uh, reason why we're promoting and telling people to eat more of our local foods and turning it to flour so it has more shelf life years and at the same time is easy access. Um, it's available and ready. And one of the objectives of our um, what we're looking at at Island Food now is to be able to place these products in the markets so it will be available and accessible to all that even those that don't have land. So other benefits of in our campaign, other benefits of eating local food, we say go local for chief, C-H-E-E-F. It's an acronym that C stands for culture. It identifies who we are and the sustainable or the foods or the environment that we've been blessed with. H, as I already uh, mentioned, that it's uh, in the scientific research and proof that it is much healthier than imported processed food. And also will be benefited because it is environmentally enhanced with our environment. We can um, throw any banana peel or a coconut or a husk anywhere. It will, because it's biodegradable, it is good for all inhabitants of earth. And uh, compared to a soda, so it is the same comparison of soda in our economy development. It's um, buying soda is not gonna, the money is gonna be sent away because we don't have factory on these islands. But buying a coconut will help the farmer and also increase or improve or develop our economy locally. The last one, which is my favorite, is food security. That we will have, if we go local, teach our children to plant one food crop in a year. So at least you teach them how to live sustainably or relying on their island, even though if they have to during the educational years of college, when they come back, they still have some food or they can be, if we passed, they still can be food secured. So next slide. So that's it. If you believe in the cause, this is what you should do. If you're in Bone Bay or wherever you're and remember, next slide. Remember that change start with you. you. You're the best model if you, and the best material to raise awareness, communication, messages, if you walk the talk. So change start with you. Let's go local. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Eminer. That was really wonderful, wonderful presentation and, and wonderful work. Yes, thank you, thank you. 
Um, let's move to our next speaker then. I'll just remind everybody, uh, as you have questions come up in your mind, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will sort those out and have our presenters answer, answer you later uh, at the end after all the presenters have gone. Our next presenter is also in Pompeii. It's Adelino Lorenz. He is an island agriculturalist focused on sustainable agroforestry, and he promotes indigenous food, cropping, and livestock systems. Um, and also for multiple benefits, culture, health, environment, economic, and food security, as Eminer has just um, listed those goals. And so we're very uh, honored to have Adelino here. He's here in person. Um, and we also have a video from the field that we're going to show um, that Adelino's team made. So um, would you like to just uh, say hello and then we'll run the video, Adelino? Yeah, uh, thank you, Craig. And uh, thank you, Amina, for doing the job for us. I think you did great. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I, you know, I have, we split the presentation. Hello, everybody. And uh, yeah, so I will, I will ask uh, Craig to please uh, play the video. Okay. Just a moment, here we go. in the Federated States of Micronesia. My On indigenous crops. Kasalelia Mainko, welcome to Pohnpei, a breadfruit island in the Federated States of Micronesia. My name is Atelino Lawrence, retired agriculturist, focusing on indigenous crops. I will take you for a quick tour to introduce some of the unique features about breadfruit in Pohnpei. We live and raise with breadfruit for culture, health, environment, economic and food security benefits. The Pohnpeian traditional culture plays a major role to sustain the diversity of multiple cultivars in Bradford, early and late varieties. Important for a family to stay engaged with the annual cult cultural practices such as first harvest hoverings to the paramount chief, the non market every year. Additionally, breadfruit is an healthy local crop, abundantly available for food as well as rising market commodity in the local market and has potential for the overseas market. A breadfruit tree naturally provides just the right canopy and the leaf falls conveniently recycle nutrient for the companion crops. Yams, sakau, bananas, taro, coconuts, local fruits and suitable for the traditional and introduce vegetable production. The Bonpei agroforestry is a gift from God, therefore cannot be replaced. 
but has room for improvement. Breadfruit trees in the agroforestry system are considered a heavily gift as they produce food locally known as rakanlang without much additional efforts. It is also common to have breadfruit trees cultivated near homes so that there is convenient access to fruit harvesting and providing shade for the hot days. Numerous cultivars in Punpe shows great variability in fruit, leaf form, and can be seed or without seeds. The fruits are typically rough skin, known as main sarak, and smooth skin, known as main one. Breadfruit and yam are two important staple food crops, equally splitting the domestic food production year into two distinct seasons, locally known as rock, season of plandy, April to September, and isol, season of scarcity. October to March the following year, with four minor harvesting seasons throughout the 12 months period, along with yams, kava, bananas, taro, local fruits, coconuts, and many other minor crops. Recent studies and direct observation indicate the need for conserving traditional knowledge relating to the different breadfruit cultivars in Bonte. Breadfruit is a major staple food of Bonte and is particularly important in the subsistence economy. Yeah, thank you. So that's the end of uh, our presentation from Pontus. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Adelino. Um, I really appreciated the video, especially seeing your your Arga forestry cops behind you there, and um, hearing mm -hmm. your your um, your wisdom on on how to how to preserve these traditional systems. So, thank you. Um, okay, so um, let's let's um, keep moving so that we can have all the presenters um, yes. conclude. And um, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Andrew McGregor, who is a Fiji-based economist. And he specializes in Pacific Islands agriculture and natural resources. He's an author and he directs Coco Singa, um, which is a, a, an organization working with farmers and uh, he has worked in most Pacific Island nations, as well as in the Caribbean and, um, and here in Hawaii. So it's a great honor to have Andrew with us. Unfortunately, due to technical um, reasons, we're unable to see uh, Andrew's um, video feed right now, but um, we're gonna run a PowerPoint and have Andrew um, speak. So I will get the PowerPoint going for you, Andrew. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, you hope you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, sorry about no picture, but we're, we're in a lockdown phase here. We got the Indian variant of COVID three weeks ago when we really thought we were in the travel bubble and everything's closed down and my computer crashed <laughs> one day into it anyway. 
So you don't see me, but I just feel badly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is looking at uh, planting breadfruit orchards, which we've been trying to develop in Fiji as a part of the uh, Pacific Breadfruit Project. Um, wanted to establish these as a as a orchard crop. Um, so for a number of reasons we want to do this. And the main reason looking into the future, we see breadfruit as being very much a crop of the future, one that is highly resilient uh, to, to climate change for the sort of reasons that we'll talk about, which has very significant implications for Pacific Island countries. So maybe we can go to the we go to the second slide now. Let's see it, Craig. Uh, we are on the second slide. We're on the second slide. Okay, there we are. Let me just close something else that's come up. Okay, well, just looking at food security in the Pacific Islands, uh, what's an aggregate measure that's commonly used for food security, and it's this index called the, the Food Import Capability Indicator, it's an FAO statistic, and it's the ratio of how much food we import to the total exports. If we import food, we have to export it to get the money to be able to, uh, to buy that food. So that's a measure of aggregate food security. Now it can vary greatly between parts of countries, but that's an overall broad measure. So if you look at those, some of those statistics there, apart from PNG and Solomons, which are relatively food secure in terms of that, that index, although parts of those countries, urban uh, Port Moresby and places like this are highly food insecure as, as we're finding under the current crisis, uh, they, they are in aggregate fairly secure because they're rural populations. We have uh, Fiji and Vanuatu, moderately food secure, but when we look at Samoa and Tonga, they have very high food insecurity in terms of that uh, index, where their food imports are three times, in the case of Tonga, uh, Samoa, to what they export. Then we get to the atoll countries, Kiribati and Tuvalu, highest levels of food insecurity in the world. Tuvalu, 15 times is the ratio of the food imports to total exports. So they're very insecure as things stand. So I'm sure we'd get very similar figures for FSM and the North Pacific countries. They're, 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 they are South Pacific countries. The picture would be very similar. Can we go to the next one, Craig? Yes. Why is this such a big problem? Well, climate change and food security. Well, what's the, what's the implications of that? Well, we import imported grains, particularly rice, on, on average, are about half our food imports. So half of what we import, of, uh, it varies some degree between countries, our food imports mainly rice. Now, where is the rice grown? The rice is, uh, is grown mainly in Asian countries, the ones we import, and rice is highly insecure in terms of food security. We'll talk a little bit about that, why it is. Small leaves, it doesn't have anything to store, the, to store its energy in, so it's highly food insecure. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, well, what are some of the projections in the future? Uh, expected impact of climate change on uh, rice and grain production. Uh, we expect rice yields and overall production to decrease as a result of climate change. And if you look at the projection of the International Research Center for Rice, Rice and Soil Threat Repair Projections, a 1% increase in minimum nighttime temperature and the key measure of, of, of uh, climate change is minimum nighttime temperature temperature in terms of crops. So one, but just a 1% increase in, in uh, temperature is likely to lead uh, to a 10% drop, that's projected about a 10% drop in rice yields. 
well, why, why is this important? Uh, grain crops will require high amounts of imported uh, of inputs. Inputs they require lots of inputs, unlike our traditional crops. So to maintain production, you're going to have to require more and more inputs, fertilizer, fuel, which are going to cost more. So these are the reasons why you have a declining production level forecast into the future. You able to hear me okay? Coming through? Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so it, this is going to lead to a substantial increase in the real price of our imported rice, the real price, you know, how much you buy for the money you have. So not only will the, you know, the, the notional price go up, the real price in terms of your spending ability or buying ability with that money is going to is, is going to be substantial. Now, one of the reasons for that is that 10% you know, of the rice that is back, go back for a second, uh, Craig, this is important. Why it's going to go up. Let's go back to the previous one. Yeah, because 10% of rice produced, only 10%, or even less than 10% for Asian countries actually trade it. They, they, they consume it in their home country. So less and less supply, there's going to be less available for international markets. So the pressure on price is even going to be higher in, in, uh, for, for exports, for us in the Pacific Islands and other countries. So these are the sort of projections we're getting from the International Food Policy Research Institute forecast. By 2050, rice prices are expected to increase in real terms by as much as or around 35%. So that's a huge increase, you know, in terms of what we pay for rice now in nominal terms, that, that would be more than double, more than that treble, treble that. So this has very serious food security implications for our country, because we import so much of these grains. And certainly the, you know, the people who are watching this in Bonapay, in, in Tuvalu, Kiribati, it has massive implications apart from all the other pressures that are under. So that's the bad news. So we go to the next slide and we might see some, uh, some good news. You know, that this climate change creates some advantages called comparative advantages in terms of the alternative importing uh, growing rice shifting towards staples. So it has a comparative advantage if we can take advantage of it. If we can take advantage of our farmers, and that means lots of our people are going to benefit. The comparative advantage is there. God, you're going too fast. Can't, can't keep up. Okay, there's a comparative advantage towards traditional staples. The traditional staples, sweet potato, taro, yam, cassava, cassava uh, and of course, breadfruit. Those are all root crops except for breadfruit. And the reason they're so efficient in terms of uh, rising minimum nighttime temperature, which has the main impact, is that they're broadleaf, they're able to photosynthesize, store their energy underground, quite unlike grain crops, that's not possible. They don't have any to store them underground, they've got small, small leaves. So this gives a traditional Pacific Island staples a increasing comparative advantage. And that's going to be important, increasingly important scarcity of arable land, fertilizer, energy costs, etc. population. So there is an advantage, there is a, there is a good side if we are able to take advantage of it. And there's a big question of if. Next slide, please. Well, what about breadfruit? Because this is specifically about breadfruit, although those other staples are also very important and they can be often intercrop with breadfruit. So there's cropping systems, which a number of you people are directly involved looking at. Breadfruit has its ability to secure food energy from the atmosphere. Big leaves, broad leaves and canopy, and it can store that energy. And it is relatively undemanding on soil, relatively. You can't say it's not demanding on soil, under the, with our Pacific breadfruit project, we thought we could plant breadfruit anywhere. That wasn't true. You have to have reasonably fertile soil, but far less demanding than, 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 than our grain crops. 
and it's highly tolerant to climate extremes. Cyclones, certainly going to become more intense, whether we get more of them or not, that's debatable. But certainly extreme cyclones, they're more tolerant, they're going to get more of them, and bird fruit is tolerant. Okay, you lose your fruit, break the trees, but they tend to survive. That's extreme, extreme cyclones. So, it, you know, you'd lose your fruit for six months, but you, you come back in, into production. And the key, key thing, which a number of you are working in, is well suited to intercropping. This picture we're showing here, some in the intercropping pineapples. You can cassava, all sorts of crops could be grown, particularly important for atoll countries, intercropping, sustainable cropping systems. Um, so, then there's, there's sort of the potential sequential, sequential role, et cetera, et cetera. High yielding biomass, and this is where we come to the, the products that come out of this. High build, yielding in biomass can be converted to high quality. Uh, gluten-free flour-based products, substitutes for imported grain, the price of which is going to get higher and higher. So we better start preparing it. So how do we do that? Next slide, please, Craig. Well, if we're going to make a significant impact, and we're, I'm really talking about countries like Fiji, it's a little bit different in, New, in, in, in the smaller atoll countries, uh, but if we're going to really make a major impact and rather than just a marginal impact, we have to move from the wild harvest, the traditional system of big trees, and you get them when you can, et cetera, et cetera. It's okay for a subsistence type situation, but to have a major impact on something that's 50% of your import, you're going to have to do a, a lot more than just wild harvest to make any real impact other than for individual households. Uh, so, we have to develop uh, cropping systems that make a major contribution to food security. And we have to be able to produce consistent and known quality. Now, it's all very well to say you're going to process breadfruit, but the, the processing ability of different breadfruits, the efficiency of conversion from a, a fruit into flour varies greatly, et cetera, et cetera. So orchards are an essential requirement for commercial processing. We don't have orchards, we're not going to be. Cottage, cottage industry, fine, we can do it, useful, let's do it. But we have to have, uh, if we want commercial processing, we, we have to come from orchards. And in the case of Fiji, we're interested in fresh exports. Fresh exports definitely require orchards. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, so the transition from wild harvest to orchard, that's the big challenge. There's the wild harvest, the old system, climbing up the tree to get the breadfruit. And the one next to it is Mr. Prakash. Uh, he's a, probably a best breadfruit uh, orchard grower. He, was a, he, was, he transformed his declining sugarcane farm, which he was barely existing on, to a very productive food forest uh, built around breadfruit. And there's a video, which is a part of the slide here, is taken at his place. It's very well worth having a look at. So he's converted from the situation on your left to the situation on your right as a part of our Pacific Reef project. Next slide, please. Yeah, well, the requirements for a bread food orchard to realize, we realize its full potential so we've got to go to breadfruit orchards. Re so we're making reasonable progress on the orchards in Fiji. Craig's come and seen a little bit of what we're doing. How long ago was that, Craig? That's, uh, six years ago. We've made some progress, not as much as we would have hoped, but we are making progress. But the area we're not, and we're making progress on uh, some cottage industry development. They're also shown on that video. I strongly recommend you look at that. Places like the Tutu Rural Training Center, making very, very uh, good progress, and in good income generation, all the benefits and flow from that, great. And there's some more of those happening. But the real area where we're, where we're not making progress is in ma mainstream flower processing. How do we make that transition? How do we get that interest? Because you're not going to get large scale orchard development if you don't get that. 
and the exports of fresh breadfruit is fairly limited because of difficulties of, of getting it, uh, shipping it, flight schedules, because more and more difficult in these very trying times. But if you really want to have an impact, we have to be able to get into substantial processing because we, you know, we're looking at import substitution. 50% of our, our uh, grains are, are imported, something with that order for Fiji, a little bit higher in fact. Uh, not our grains, our imports are, are, are grains. So that's, that's, the re that's, that's, that's the real challenge. You know, if we could uh, reduce our rice imports by 20 or 30 percent, that that would that would be that would be substantial. And it's probably not realistic to talk about much more than that for the foreseeable future. But to get that, we have to get the mainstream processing companies involved. And I think that's a challenge for for us as the breadfruit people to 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 meet that to get them involved. All very well to talk about cottage industry and promote and do it great, great, great. And maybe that's enough for the atolls, but it's not enough for the, you know, the, the, the mid-sized Pacific Island country. We really have to move into significant uh, processing companies involved. Okay, well, that's it. That's a few pictures of the, uh, the processing of the Tutu Rural Training Centre. You can have a bit of a look at that in that uh, video link I've given you. Look at that. Uh, what, picture on the left there, good pruning, the right uh, the marcotting varieties, the right varieties, and they, and they harvest them like that. And uh, you, you keep them small, and there you go. And there you're processing, and there's the flour they're substituting. Some, some of the bread they're making now in some of the shops, using at least 30% breadfruit flour. They're having trouble, you can't go above that because people like the, the flour to rise. There are other there are other processed products you can make, but uh, the normal flour that's about the limit. I don't know if there's, we were talking a little bit about that yesterday, but that's a challenge. But it's good, great. There we are. Uh, we need to get the, the bigger companies really taking an interest in this. Okay, Nakabaka label. I hope you're able to hear me. <laughs> and sorry, uh, you couldn't see me. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Andrew. That that work is invaluable, brilliant, uh, a brilliant resource for all of us. Um, I would like to introduce our next um, panelist now, and and our final panelist. Um, this is Dr. Shane Tutua. Um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to show your video, perhaps. Uh, there we go. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you for being with us. This is. Um, as I said, Dr. Shane Tutua, he has a PhD uh, for his work in soil carbon and nutrient cycling. He's a farmer, he's an entrepreneur and trainer, and uh, he manages Zainatina Organic Demonstration and Research Farm in East Honiara, Solomon Islands. So it's a great pleasure to, to have you here with us. And uh, we all look forward to hearing your presentation if you would please unmute yourself and I will show your your PowerPoint slides. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from the Solomon Islands. Okay. Please. Hello, Craig, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Um, please, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Craig, for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of uh, breadfruit um, in the uh, local food security in, in, in the Solomon Islands, yeah. And so um, um, I'm going to go right into it now. <laughs> Um, breadfruit is, is, is um, grown and eaten all, all over the Solomons. Uh, but um, there was one particular province that uh, where breadfruit is used ex extensively and it becomes uh, like a traditional uh, staple food there. And uh, that's um, the that next uh, slide, please. Mm. Uh, next one. 
go to the next, yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah, so um, this province, uh, Temotu province or the Santa Cruz Islands, uh, it's in the far east of um, the Solomon Islands. And um, um, breadfruit is, is a staple diet for them. And um, they harvest the breadfruit and dried it into a biscuit called uh, Nambo. And um, Nambo uh, now is increasingly used by um, Solomon Islanders um, because um, the people from Temotu, they, they come and sell it in Honiara and people buy it and they uh, um, consume it. And so it's becoming uh, more like a mainstream food now. Next. Yeah, so Nambo is, is um, um, made by um, roasting the, the breadfruit. I think uh, most Pacific Island do that, yeah. And then they slice them into uh, small cubes um, before they dry them, yeah. So the next slide. Um, uh, traditionally, the number of cubes were dried um, by put, putting them inside some specially made baskets and then they hang them over the fire and then they constantly turn them um, to, until they dry out. Yeah, but uh, now they use um, hot air um, using drums where they build fire inside the drums and then produce uh, hot air. And then they uh, put these drums under a floor where they put the um, breadfruit uh, bread uh, cubes. And uh, that's how they dry them now, yeah. So if you go to the, to the next uh, slide, yeah, that's how it looks like after it's being dried. Um, that's the number, uh, famous number from the Solomon Islands or from Temotu province, yeah. Next slide. Yeah, so um, after drying, they are stored uh, in uh, those buckets or even bags um, and they can be transported that way and they can store up to two years. That's what I, I understand from the people from Temotu. Next one. Yeah, so uh, traditional uses of number. Uh, it is food for long uh, fishing trips. Um, they also use them during disaster time uh, when they could not go out and fetch food. And then they also use them when uh, food is scarce, maybe a long drought or something like that. Yeah, so that's how they um, use them. Next slide. Um, modern users, they, you can uh, have the Nambo biscuits uh, with your tea. Uh, and my company, we also produce uh, uh, mueslis from breadfruit and nali nut. Uh, on, the, on, on the right there, we produce nali nut bars with uh, breadfruit and also uh, mueslis um, in those as, as break, breakfast uh, cereals. Next one. Yeah, so uh, breadfruit and food security. Um, the characteristics of breadfruit makes it an ideal crop for food security uh, purposes in uh, Solomon Islands. Why? Because it grows well everywhere in, in the Solomons. It can be stored for long periods, up to two years. And also it can be integrated into agroforestry system and increase food diversity and resilience and therefore food security. Um, we go to the next uh, slide. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the improved Temotu traditional agriculture. And um, they integrate uh, breadfruit into this agroforestry system. Uh, and um, so that uh, breadfruit and other uh, tree crops, they provide um, food in these uh, um, resilient food production systems. Next one. Yeah, so in, uh, in short uh, summary, uh, red food is an important traditional food uh, for people in Temotu uh, since time immemorial. It continues to be an important food, food source um, in these modern times in the, uh, in the Solomons. And uh, 
uh, its adaptability and versatility in various and, and also re resilience in um, various soil and climatic conditions. Uh, longer storage uh, when, when dried and value add adding uh, potential make it an important crop for food security purposes throughout the Solomon Islands. Next one. Okay, thank you Thomas from the Solomon Islands. Thank you so much, Shane. That, that was very, very interesting. I, I wasn't aware of a lot of what you presented today. Um, let me see here. Okay, we can get back to this. There you are. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I was just reflecting on how wonderful it is. We have uh, Shane from Solomon Islands. We have um, Adelino and Eminer from Pompeii, Doc Tusi from Hawaii and Samoa, and Andrew and Fiji. How wonderful it is we can come together this way. Um, the next, the next portion of our webinar is to address some questions from participants, and we have a number of questions here. Uh, before we do this, I will um, just introduce Megan Lealoha Ao, who's working in the background to to help uh, respond to various questions and chats and handle the technology. Um, Megan is a community facilitator. She's a healer and she's also a uh, uh, kind of a mom with endless superpowers. So thank you very much for joining us, Megan. I know you have a very busy life and it's wonderful to have you here. Um, so let's go on to some of the questions here. Um, let me see. Do, do you have any comments, Megan, at this point? Um, because you've had a chance to look at questions and I'm just kind of catching up a little bit. Mahalo. Aloha nui kako. Um, mahalo so much for the opportunity to be with you folks and listen in. Um, just one little thing for the answered questions that we had. Um, there was a big interest in preservation of breadfruit and Eminer shared that there's a link that um, Craig has access to to share about their practices. So. We'll be sending you folks either if we find it in time for the chat, we'll put it in there. Um, or if not, then we'll do a follow up email with that link that Emmanuel talked about for the preservation of Ulu, as well as um, people were asking for the, the video that Andrew referenced. So we'll get those two links to folks either in the chat or the follow up email, but just want to uh, put that in there. And I think there's about five open questions right now that we can look at, Craig. Yes, so uh, why don't we take the question, a uh, question for Andrew here. Um, it's a question about switching from sugarcane uh, or some other type of monocrop, I assume, to breadfruit. How long before you start to see some, some income? Because this would have to be one of the key points of consideration for farmers. So this is a question from Riten Gosai. And perhaps Andrew could, um, begin uh, the answer for that and any other panelists could follow up after after you, Andrew. Andrew, have you, are you muted? Uh, I don't see Andrew is muted right now, so perhaps you could unmute. Uh, uh, am I still muted? No, no. Now, now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, let's. There's two aspects of that. Uh, following the package, the practices that uh, we develop collaboration with what they've done in the, in the Caribbean and in other places. Uh, we found that normally you'd expect it to, it may take three, three or four years for a breadfruit tree to come into production, but with the, the proper uh, 
using the proper material and following the right cultural practices. We were able to get production in uh, in just uh, just two years, and that picture I showed you from Tampa Uni, they harvest in that bread for that two years. So that's one aspect. You come into production early, it still takes a few bit longer to come into full production. Okay, um, we seem to have lost you, Andrew, unless that was the end of your answer. Actually, I think, uh, I think Andrew's dropped out. Um, his connection has dropped. So are there any other panelists who'd like to address this issue of income generation from breadfruit? Um, I don't know if perhaps Adelino might like to tackle that, or perhaps Kyle has the, uh, Kyle would like to, uh, Chime in here. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Craig. Uh, no, just to highlight uh, that uh, there is a research report that uh, uh, Dr. McGregor was involved on the economics of breadfruit in Fiji, and it does a comparison of the uh, gross margins for sugarcane production in the Western Division and then uh, uh, breadfruit uh, orchard production. Uh, but I guess the key message there was uh, it needs to involve intercropping uh, breadfruit orchards on their own. Uh, is, a, is a hard sell, um, but uh, the economic models that show income from short-term crops as the trees are growing look quite favorable, especially compared to um, you know, traditional commodities like, uh, like sugarcane. So we'll make sure that uh, um, that paper is available on the uh, Breadfruit People website. Okay, great. Dr. Tusi. Yeah, if I can add to that uh, too, Craig, um... I remember the uh, with uh, Diane Rigoni and uh, Susan Merch. Uh, they were able to get um, the uh, cellular propagation from uh, certain companies, in which they were able to ship as many as uh, five thousand little uh, plantlets uh, a month, and then uh, there were sales all over Oahu. Uh, uh, Haula was one of the major ones, uh, but I think there's been some more. Well, uh, recent um, research that I think uh, goes, if you're looking at commercial value, if you're looking only at the fruit, there are other aspects of the fruit of the tree that's generating tremendous in interest. For example, uh, I think there's a large uh, process of growing. Unfortunately, I suspect monocropping because uh, they want the... Um, well, they want the squalene. Squalene is something that they were able to extract from the tree, uh, but it has properties that have medical, uh, medical research has shown that it has an impact on cancer, uh, among other things. In fact, the uh, COVID-19 has looked at squalene that's been extracted from plants and breadfruit is one of them. The major source of squalene is shark livers. So it they ex killed millions of sharks just to extract the squalene. They've now discovered that it's also in the breadfruit leaves and in the, in the male flower. The other aspect is uh, the male flower uh, has apparently uh, uh, the traditional uh, voyagers would gather the dried male flower and uh, light it to keep away pests mosquitoes. So an actual study was done by the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Defense. And what they discovered in the smoke and also with the Breadfruit Institute was that uh, it, came, it contains three compounds more potent than DEET. So if you're looking at uh, the, this, the, these other uh, uh, byproducts and then also the, the, the sap, which is a form of latex, it's biodegradable. And there, uh, right now there's research looking at uh, converting that sap into latex uh, gloves because it breathes. So uh, especially for medical sensitive kind of situations. Uh, so my point is, 
um, if you're looking only for the fruit, it might take a minimum um, of three years. Uh, I would say you're, you're, you'd be good if you, you're able to get a, a good harvest in seven years. But meanwhile, it can continue to produce these other byproducts that you might want to look at. So you're not, I mean, there, there are multiple commercial opportunities, but uh, what we do is mainly just gather the, the information and share it. And then try to connect the right uh, players with whoever's doing what, producing what. But uh, keep in mind, this, this tree provides more than just the fruit. Thank you very much, Dr. Tusi. How about we go to another question? This one is from Viliami Kami. And perhaps um, Eminer would like to address this from, from the Pohnpei experience. It's about flour and what it would take to, um, to, to have a significant impact on, on import substitution. Uh, of other flowers. Whoops, <laughs> where did you go, Eminer? Uh, you just went off the screen. Um, so the question you know, is- Andrew came back, I don't know where I went. <laughs> okay, did there you, you are. There's Andrew. Um, but um, maybe we can return to you in a moment. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm okay. sorry. Did, okay. I'm sorry, can you ask that question? Tell me when you want me to come back, but I don't know what happened. Just, just... Okay, okay, thank you. We're, um, we're on to a question about import substitution, which I'm hoping um, uh, not to put Eminer on the spot, but I know that you've worked a lot with replacing imported flour. And so the question is, what would it take to have a significant impact at the household level on import substitution of other flowers? And if you could just unmute yourself Perhaps Adelino might like to chime in because I know Island Food Community has really been focusing on on this on this problem for quite a while. And uh, if, if you feel comfortable, please um, let us know your thoughts. Um, and otherwise, um, we can uh, have open it up to any panelists. Um, just unmute, unmute your, your microphone. There we go. Um, still can't hear you. Hello, Bulabanaka. Okay. <laughs> Bula, Andrew, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you well. I can hear you well. Okay. You were, you were asking a bit about uh, having significant import substitution. Uh, what, one, of, one, of, one of the big problems at present is the price of uh, uh, redfruit flour for the, for instance, the Tutu Rural Training Center. You know, they, they can sell it for uh, $4 to $5 a kilo. Well, that's about, that's about more than twice the price of rice uh, or, or wheat flour. So that's that's making it competitive is difficult. Uh, part of that's due to the varieties. They're, they're processing a small variety. Now they're going to a bigger variety, which has uh, four or five times the size of the good, uh, good processing quality, so they can get their price down. Uh, that they need to go to a larger scale technology, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, that, it's, it's a cost factor. That, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's a key consideration. Uh, there's also, over time, there's, a, you know, there's, there's issues of uh, how you, you, are you going to get it readily available? Are the other are 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 brick processors going to have it there? Are the are are bread companies interested? I'm talking about the, of the Fiji situation. So we, we, have, we definitely have to get the, the price available to the consumer. So, and that's not going to happen too much from the cottage industry uh, process. That's why to have any significant impact, you have to. Uh, the, the flour mills of Fiji, the Punjas, these people are interested. And they're showing some module of interest, but it's, it's taken time. And unfortunately, our project never had that component. It was always going to be there, but it never happened. 
and that's where we need some support to go to that next stage. Thank you, Andrew. Um, anyone else? I'm in there. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. I'm not sure your microphone is, is working because you are unmuted. Yes. Um, okay. Can't hear you. Okay. Um, yeah. While Amina is uh, trying to find herself in this, uh, 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 I, you know, what I would like, it's really interesting for small islands, the Atoll Islands, because we're not talking about or or charging and even uh, mixing. You know, if we are able to produce uh, breadfruit flour in small volumes in the villages, you know, it's interesting to hear the uh, the ratio of mixing uh, uh, breadfruit flour with uh, flowers that we we are importing. Thirty uh, percent. We would like to find out more about that. But that's really practical to the case in Bone Bay and small islands, I think. Okay, thank you, Adelino. Um, how about now, Eminer? No, we can't, we still can't hear you. Okay, while you work on that, let's just, um, um, we'll, we'll return to you and, but, um, Perhaps we can address another um, another question. How about a question for Shane? Um, and I'm sure many of us have a similar question about how to find out more about the method of drying Nambo and um, uh, and and how how you use it. So, how would a person learn more about that uh, Nambo methodology that you have? Um, I think the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture is producing a video um, on this, so um, probably they can be contacted to um, share it, uh, the Director of Extension, yeah, because yeah, I am, I, I, I don't know much about this process, so I yeah, probably that, that video will be very helpful for people who are interested. Can't hear you, Craig. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so we will, we will send participants uh, links for uh, to find more information on on things like that, and so we will we will give you more information on that later. Um, how about do we have audio from Eminer? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now I, I unplug I unplugged the headset, except I will hear very little. The volume on my laptop is not uh, high. So um, I think the question is, because I, I didn't talk about it. We just skipped that uh, slide of washing and uh, slicing or cutting into smaller pieces, sun drying it, and then milling it. But if the question is also referring to the traditional way of preservation, preserving our breadfruit, then that's in the video that 
I send it to you. Talking about, um, if I may, I um, since island food is where, when we think about, uh, you know, when I first came on board, it's like raising awareness. But to an, I just want to share. Uh, I just got got a call from my. Uh, I just got a call from my staff that. Like I mentioned yesterday that we just started to, we've been trying to keep them, distribute the machines to the communities, the municipal offices and other groups to train them on how to make flour from our local food, but it seems like it never get to the market or the machines were not being utilized. So this week I told my staff that it's time that we we do it. Let's do it and see if, you know, if the businesses doesn't want it to, if it's really not that attractive or nobody wants to buy it. Cause I've been begging for home, my, my family using the, and use it in other recipes. So this week we started, like Adelino mentioned, it's, Bone Bay is not, um, actually we have no factory yet. So we're using very small scale uh, milling machines that we send, we train and we send them to the municipal offices or big like organizations to start at the community level if it will raise interest. And um, we have two, grant, two, two proposals, two grants that help with that still no movement or the objective or output I want to see is still not because we are like only us the staff or maybe our families are utilizing this flood. But the interest has been from people not locally, which is uh, the expatriates that come and work, uh, embassies, staff embassies. So this week we started to we walk into um, businesses that sell bread or flour based food pastries. Farm Terrace was interested. So we started Monday. So today, Monday was, they reported it's not enough because sold out just that night. And actually we wanted to, like me, I have no entrepreneurship, uh, knowledge. So I say, maybe we start small because I don't want to waste money. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we send in like um, 10, 10 only loaves. Let's see where 10 loaves go. How far can we go? So Tuesday, they call that, it's also that, that first night. It's just uh, the staff because we, we uh, mix in the morning. And then uh, by the time it's raised, you know, the bread is raised, ready to be baked. And then they cool off a little bit and then back and uh, ship it or transport to the market. So we, we already made that schedule that it's gonna be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So Wednesday, we triple the, our uh, mix, our recipe. And then yesterday, my staff called me that, oh, it's, um, it's only, oh, we got seven more. That's yesterday, um, yesterday morning. So I told her th this morning, okay, go for one, one mix. So when she went today, she called me again. Everything is sold out. They were, I, I only, I brought only eight, <laughs> eight loaves. And the matter is, that's not enough. <laughs> but you know, just to let you know that this is, we just started and we need more. Uh, we're, I'm not a business uh, person. And um, I would love to hear advice to, um, because it scared me not to like spend that much, but it's not going to run back the revenue. So. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. I know it's 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 a it's a very um, in some ways complex problem. The yeah, import substitution. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 relieving to know that wow, really. So I was like not testing it out. I feel so uh, insecure that it's not gonna be sell. But now it gives us that. So next week we will um, try to not try. We will call for a bigger, um, bigger production to mm -hmm. see. Thank you. That's very positive. Sorry. Thank you so much. I don't think it's right. something that we're interested with others, but uh, it's something. It's an experience that I, I. It's the first time for me to not not very secure, and then. Oh, Okay, if I'm secure now, yeah. knowing that uh, our awareness paid off with, you know, even with just this small uh, reaction from uh, consumers, I'm I'm relaxed to know that the awareness of raising and um, advocating for eating local food and taking it to the next step of having it flour because children now are people want to eat more bread these days. So putting in the bread, it's, and like you said, import substitution also. Yes, thank, thank you. you, that's very heartening. Um, we've come to the end of our time here. Uh, we are actually a, a little bit over our allotted time and I wanna be respectful of our participants' um, schedules and so forth. And I'm very grateful that everyone Many of our participants have, have been here for over an hour and a half. Um, I, I would like to invite um, uh, Kyle to, to say a few last words. And I don't know if, uh, Dr. Tusi, do you, do you have any uh, last thoughts that you'd like to share before Kyle uh, goes? Um, Thank you, sisters. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed uh, the information sharing. But um, as I had mentioned before, we are a university research. For flower, we work closely with the Kansas State University. That's what they do. They do millions of uh, pounds daily of flower. So we had their lead person come out here to look at flower making, went to Samoa, et cetera. So as far as flower making, marketing, all of these uh, kinds of things that a university can be a resource to, um, please just get in contact uh, through us, uh, through Craig, and then uh, we can line up the subject matter experts as well as the technologies. There's some technologies already in place uh, in the islands that can deal with actually uh, a, a tons of uh, dried breadfruit per day. So uh, that's what we do. We just basically bring together uh, subject matter experts and technologies and we share the information. So please contact Craig and we'll assist you uh, where we can. But love to hear all the exciting work that's currently being done. Thank you. Kyle. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, no, I just uh, just tell you how excited we are about uh, breadfruit people. Uh, this is our third webinar. Our, our website is live, and our Facebook page is live, and we're getting so many um, messages and uh, uh, emails from all around the world, and uh, we're just encouraged uh, at how willing people are to share information, and uh, that's basically what uh, the breadfruit people is about. Is about networking and sharing information. Uh, so thank you so much to uh, all the presenters tonight. Uh, if you haven't visited the website, I encourage you to go there, breadfruitpeople.com. There's a place where you can subscribe, put your email address, and we'll uh, be sending out uh, uh, newsletters and interesting uh, articles. And of course, engage with us on, on Facebook. Um, and tell your friends, uh, we've got more webinars upcoming. Uh, with uh, just uh, lots of great content, keeping it uh, as practical as possible. Uh, and uh, through the, the generosity of, 
uh, all these presenters willing to just share. Um, uh, I'm just excited that we can continue to access information that can help us develop this crop. And of course, uh, thank you to, uh, to Craig uh, and Megan for facilitating all of this. Thank you so much, Vinaka. Vinaka, Kyle, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us and sharing your 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 experience, your knowledge, and your your good intentions for all. Thank you to uh, Kalani Souza once again, Abolohana Foundation for opening our session, and um, thank you to all of our participants uh, from around the world who have joined us and asked so many good questions. And um, there's been a lively chat as well. So. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again in two weeks. And uh, we, we expect to have another very interesting session. Um, so we'll hear from you soon, and you'll hear from us. OK. Aloha, everyone. Bula vinaka.